I think um, I, I should be placed in a position where I can no longer inflict harm upon others. This is Colin Ireland. On January the 1st, 1993, he made a New Year's resolution to become a serial killer. In just three months, he brutally murdered five men. Tonight, the full story of his reign of terror told for the first time by the man himself. In his own words, Colin Ireland reveals how and why he killed again and again. I, I went and got a plastic bag from the kitchen carrier bag and I stuck it over his head and got a bit of a struggle and I killed him quickly, very quickly. Colin Ireland was a nobody and he thought the best way to be a somebody was to become a serial killer. His killing spree in London in the 1990s was short and brutal. He killed five gay men, four of them, in just 15 days. He became known as the Gay Slayer. Although born in the 1950s, Ireland's early life reads like a chapter from a Dickens novel. Born in a former workhouse in Kent, he and his 17-year-old mother were abandoned by his father. Over the next six years, they were forced to move homes nine times. He didn't speak about his, um, his past at all, really. He kept that very much to himself. Um, he did mention once about um, coming home from school and his, his mother had moved, which uh, does tend to make you feel a bit sympathetic towards somebody. In later life, he ran away to London, drifting between unskilled jobs and petty crime. He also claimed to have been the victim of a sexual assault by a man. In 1989, though, it seemed he'd finally found some security. After a whirlwind romance, he married Janet Young. It doesn't seem like the same person to me. That isn't the person I knew. That isn't the person I was married to. Looking back, he had a very difficult childhood and youth. I didn't know he'd been in prison except once. It seems a very poor excuse for what he did, but um, who knows how people's minds work. The marriage certainly didn't work, and at the start of 1993, now in South End, Ireland made the decision that would change his life forever. Bitter about his past and his present, he planned a future as a multiple murderer. And like many who had gone before him, he sought out easy targets. If you want to be a serial killer, and Ireland certainly wanted to be a serial killer, then you look for people who are vulnerable. Hitchhikers, people running away from the law, homosexuals and prostitutes. Ireland's victims would be gay men, many of whom lived double lives, anxious to conceal their sexuality from their families. His hunting ground, a West London pub where questions weren't asked and where gay men could find casual partners. On the 8th of March, he paid his first visit, still unsure whether to begin his killing spree. I think it's something that's been triggering me some time before. That I felt if I was approached, I felt there was a likelihood that I would kill. Um, I thought to myself, if I'm approached, something will happen. If I'm not, it would have been quite likely I, I would have gone on my way and maybe nothing would have happened. Um, can I get a glass of water, please? Also in the pub that evening was Peter Walker, a 45-year-old West End theatre director. The men talked and arranged to spend more time together. We went in a cab to his flat in Battersea. I work nearly every night, so it's nice to have a bit of company, to be honest. I put on a pair of gloves on the way. Uh, my intentions were different to his. According to Ireland, when they got home, Walker agreed to be tied up as part of a sex game. 
Once he'd bound him to the bed, Ireland delivered a vicious and ultimately lethal beating. My body was tied up. I, I went and got a plastic bag from the kitchen, carry it back, and I stuck it over his head. And I think in a way he wanted to die. I think in a way he probably didn't even realise it, but I, I detected him in this, in this, this lack of desire to carry on. And I, I think he knew he was going to die, and he was, he was quite controlled about it. It was almost like a, a thing that was going to happen. It was like almost like a fake thing. With his first victim dead, Ireland erased all traces of himself from the flat. An avid reader of true crime books and FBI manuals, he knew how important it was to be meticulous. Surfaces were cleaned, clothes changed, and everything he had bought was packed up, ready to be disposed of. He also rifled through Walker's possessions, taking his credit cards, but he was in no hurry to leave. This was to become Ireland's post-killing ritual. He'd clean up the murder scene and then, worried about attracting attention by leaving in the middle of the night, he'd stay with the body until the morning, often just casually watching TV. I remember after Walker looking in the mirror, I mean, I walked down the road and I thought, people must see it in my face, I've just murdered someone, they must be able to tell, they must just by, by looking at me. I remember losing my virginity. You know, and I remember that same feeling then, it was like, you were almost buzzing. The following day, Ireland withdrew money using Walker's bank cards. He destroyed them, and along with keys he had taken, threw them into the Thames from Battersea Bridge. On the train home to South End, he disposed of his murder kit, hurling it into a canal. It would be another 24 hours before his first victim was discovered. About uh, 10 to 1, got the call down to where Peter Walker lived. He'd been found dead by the caretaker. Peter was uh, lying in bed. He had a duvet pulled over him and his feet were sticking out. There was, curiously, two teddy bears positioned on top of the duvet in an inverted position, you could say the 69 position. Uh, he had a condom on his nose, trailed across his cheek, and he had another condom in his mouth. Police would later discover the reason why the body was left this way. Ireland had discovered Walker was HIV positive. Furious he wasn't told, he wanted to humiliate him, leaving objects on his body in a ritualistic way. In South End, Ireland was concerned. His first murder had attracted no publicity. Unaware that the police had already found the body, he called the Samaritans. He wasn't looking for help, he was looking for recognition. Can I just ask what the address is for? Will you just listen? There are two dogs and they've been locked in a room for two days. At five o'clock that evening, we got a message from the Samaritans. They'd received a call from a chap who had given them Peter's name his address, and he got quite agitated when pushed for further information. Because the owner's dead. I killed him. Ireland felt his call hadn't been taken seriously, so an hour later he dialed again, this time to the Sun newspaper. I worked at the Sun a long time, and I've, I've never taken a call like that. I just literally picked up the phone. Um, to a man who started talking about two dogs locked in a flat, then just suddenly dropped this bombshell that, that the owner of the flats was still in there and that he'd murdered the owner of this flat. Certainly in America you get situations where the uh, killer plays with the media and that's part of the, 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 the buzz they get out of it. But in, in the 1990s we hadn't had that situation arise in England. He wanted attention almost from day one. It was clear that he wanted to be uh, a star of the newspapers. It was my New Year's resolution to kill a homosexual. He was a homosexual and into that kinky sex. You're into all that stuff, aren't you? He, he wasn't panicky, he, he wasn't angry. He didn't sound like someone who just tied up a man, murdered him. He just sounded relatively cool and calm and collected, really. The first call was to Scotland Yard. About two hours later, they came back 
and basically confirmed everything. They'd found the body, the dogs, the whole story was, was confirmed. To display such an arrogance, such bravado at this stage there meant that we didn't have the run-of-the-mill murder on our hands here. There was someone here who um, needed to be caught as quickly as possible. After discovering more about the victim's background, the police made a TV appeal for help. I've been joined now by Detective Inspector Martin Finnegan, who is investigating Peter Walker's death. We therefore need to hear from anybody, whether it be customers, cab drivers, anybody at all, who saw him after 5pm that Monday evening, the 8th of March. Within hours, it became apparent that uh, we're dealing with uh, a death of a member of the, of the gay community. You've got to remember that we're talking about people's sex lives here. Someone's gay and their immediate family or relatives or work colleagues don't know that's exactly the way they want to leave it. That was a concern to us because our priority was investigating Peter's murder. And if they chose not to tell us about the, their activities, then of course uh, we had nothing to investigate. Persuading the wider gay community to cooperate proved even more difficult than the police thought. Back in 1993, their relations with the police were non-existent. Looking back now, it seems extraordinary because they clearly lack knowledge of gay lives. To a small degree, that's understandable because most of what they were getting from the gay community was hostility, but that was quite understandable because we were feeling um, got at and not being protected. Uh, we explored every avenue we could, but the frustrating thing was we still never actually knew what actually happened in those last hours of his life. There came a point where we had to close the inquiry uh, effectively. With the investigation shelved, it seemed Ireland had got away with it. For the next two months, he laid low. But his taste for murder would soon return. Then I've reached a point where I'd, I can just stop myself. In some moves, I'm quite happy to burn the world down if possible. Very cold streak, deep streak. On New Year's Day 1993, Colin Ireland had resolved to become a serial killer. By March that year, he was on his way having claimed his first victim. I'm probably 60, 70% quite a reasonable human being most of the time. But there's, there is that side of my character that is negative. It's quite cold and calculating. At the time of the murders, Ireland was living in South End. He had moved here after splitting up from his wife, Janet Young. At the time I met him, I think I was quite a vulnerable person. I was running a pub on my own. I had two children. And he came to the pub um, to stay for bed and breakfast. And he came into the doorway. And he just completely filled the entire doorway. And the whole conversation in the pub just stopped. He was controlling. He took over. He picked up on the things I needed help with. And it, he just seemed an answer to a prayer at the time. The couple wed shortly afterwards. But within four months, it was over. In breaking up, Ireland showed a ruthlessness that shocked his family. We had a busy Easter in the pub, and everything was fine. So after Easter, we decided we'd have a few days off. So we drove up to London. Um, I got on the bus with the children, because that was convenient. He went off, as I thought, to South End to stay with his friends. Um, but when he didn't come to pick us up on the Sunday, we had a bit of a panic and we phoned to make sure he had, wasn't in hospital. And they said, oh, well, he came and said that the bailiffs were coming, so he was taking everything to a safe place. So naturally, everybody let him take virtually everything that I owned. Um, and he cleared out all the bank accounts, took my car, took our wedding album, I think mainly so he could say to the next person, look, I'm a really normal, well put together man. This is my ex-wife, this is my children. By the summer of 1993, Ireland was anything but a normal, well put together man. He'd killed once and was preparing to do so again. The police investigation into Peter Walker's murder had come to a standstill. Ireland's meticulous clean-up routine had wiped the scene of any forensic clues, and detectives had failed to find any witnesses within London's gay community. In June, Ireland felt confident enough to pay another visit to the Colherne pub in Fulham. Once inside the well-known gay haunt, he struck up conversation with another customer, 37-year-old librarian, Christopher Dunn. 
he was just in there early evening, five, six o'clock. And we got talking, I realised he was that tight. I saw the guy he killed in here a few times. I've seen nice enough. I just don't get why someone would do that. I think he's long gone by now. We hope. As with Peter Walker, Ireland went back to Dunn's flat for sex. Once again, he demanded money with horrific violence. And I asked him his pin number, and it was one that struck me big, totally ridiculous. You know, it was three, or three digits in a row of the same. And I thought, well, that's not really a pin number someone would choose personally. Um, so I, uh, I, uh, I got a, uh, a lighter and I stuck the flame to his testicles. After subjecting Dunn to this torture, Ireland strangled him. He's like a director. He's got a video in his head. He knows where he wants to go. He's tied up his victims exactly as he wants, and that gives him a great deal of power and control. He then jacks it up a stage to actually strangulation. People like him who are planning it and enjoying it, that's the buzz. And that's the thing that leads him on to do it again, and again, and again. Careful as ever, Ireland cleaned up the murder scene thoroughly. He even threw away his torch batteries after wiping his prints off them. I got this one off the bill, and that was taking the batteries out of the torch and wiping prints off the of blows and putting them back in with gloves on. Um, so you ought to ban that program. Once again, Ireland withdrew cash from his victim's account. He saw this as reimbursement for the cost of the latest murder and as advance expenses for the next. For every new victim, Ireland bought new handcuffs, shoes, clothes, rope and gloves. He bought cheap handcuffs and a commonly used type of rope in case it was ever found. Following each killing, Ireland dumped part of the murder kit in the Thames and the rest out of the window during the train journey back home to South End. Once there, he'd call in on Richard Higgs, one of the few people who had regular contact with him. But Richard had no idea of his friend's secret life. Colin would come in and see me every three, four weeks. He didn't stay long. Um, usually just came in, had a, a brief chat. Um, spoke about what was happening in his life and, and left. The two men had met whilst working at a night shelter for the homeless. Ireland was sacked after complaints about his behaviour. He was angry and depressed and hated his new job, breaking up wooden pallets. He didn't get uh, the, the job satisfaction at all um, on the other little jobs that he did. Uh, nothing um, satisfied him like working at the night shelter. So what have you been up to then? Not much. Still working at that place down the road. Can't tell you how much I hate it though. He was living in a bed sit. He was very unhappy. Lost is a good word. That would sum it up. He was lost. I personally felt quite sorry for him at the time, uh, for that yeah, six month way. period after yeah. he left the night shelter. Might help me out with something. Well, that's good. Might head down there again next week. I think he used to sort of come here to, to test the ground to see whether anybody had mentioned anything or if there was anything untoward. It's spooky to think that um, I was totally unaware of what was happening. I had no idea what, what was going on at all. Back in London, despite the two victims drinking in the same pub, the two killings were not linked. At the time, the Metropolitan Police Force was split into five areas. As Walker and Dunn lived in two different areas, their murders were investigated by two separate teams. There was very little cooperation across forces in London or sharing of information as there is now, so that a murder in one patch would not necessarily be linked automatically with a murder in another patch. And there was a further problem. Because Dunn was gay and because of how his body was found, police suspected his death was a sordid accident rather than a murder. As a result, it barely made a paragraph in the local paper. The level of knowledge displayed by the police at the time of gay lives and their willingness to believe that an awful lot of murders were sex games gone wrong or accidents seems extraordinary. Oh. 
Ireland grew more frustrated. His craving for recognition wasn't being fulfilled. Just a week later, he bought another return ticket to London and made another trip to the Colhearn. It was building up. I was on sort of almost like a roller coaster thing. And I, I just, I felt, you know, there was, there was more I was doing, you know. One of the things we know with, with serial killers is that they tend to get on a kind of roller coaster of escalation. They speed up their, their, their killing rate, and it almost feels like he's out of control. And to some extent, he is out of control. He's just got to carry on feeding this, this urge, this need he has. Listen, I'm really sorry. I'm supposed to be meeting a friend. I'll catch you later. Sure. If Ireland had been disappointed by the lack of publicity for his crimes, things were about to change. His next victim would be Perry Bradley, son of a US congressman. Ireland made a beeline for him at the Colhearn on June the 4th. He was a businessman. He had a flat nearby in Kensington. And we went back to the flat. Once there, Ireland resumed his by now familiar routine of torture and extortion. Well, it's happening. And there's not a lot you can do about it. So, what happens now? I'm a professional thief, and believe me, I'll do anything to get money. I've tortured people to get what I want. And I'll start hurting you if you don't tell. I'm capable of killing you. You've got no need to do that. Please, I'll give you the money, I'll give you what you want. I'll go get you the money myself if you want. No. I won't allow it. Don't worry. I won't let them find you tomorrow all tied up. You know, I said to him, it's going to be a long night. I said, I suggest you get some sleep if you can. And uh, I just sat and listened to the radio and he actually went to sleep. Bradley, amazingly, did go to sleep, unaware that the man in his flat had already killed twice. By morning, he would have killed three times. And while he was asleep, I, I put a noose around his neck. He barely came to, he barely came to, it was quite quick. I, I throttled him with the noose, and he hardly struggled. And uh, um, Sam, for instance, Walker, it took longer. After claiming his latest victim, Ireland turned on the radio and began the usual clean-up operation. But for once, his familiar calm seemed to desert him. I think that affected me mentally to quite a degree. Sitting in with these, these bodies for sort of like um, five or six hours on some occasions, um, watching them gradually sort of look, get blotchy as they do and cold. And, um, it wasn't wasn't something that I don't think I could cope with, to be honest, and dealing with it too well. The discovery of Perry Bradley's body sparked yet another murder investigation. But once again, police failed to link this death with the earlier killings. It did attract national publicity, though. Claiming to be the killer, Back in South End, Ireland watched the TV news coverage at his friend's house. Want to talk to him again. Colin turned to me and said, what do you think of this, then? Another natter on the loose. Unbelievable, isn't it? Just, just sort of raised his eyebrows and didn't agree with me. <laughs> I, I can't put it into words. I can't explain how it makes you feel. Foolish, perhaps, that you didn't notice, but uh, surprised, mainly, I think. Surprised. Yeah. They believe they could prove vital witness. Ireland was frustrated. He'd killed three times. The problem was that the police were not linking the crimes. Therefore, no one even acknowledged that a multiple murderer was on the loose. So Ireland just carried on killing. Collier. I think Collier was the only one I was angry with, in a funny way. It was the only one I got across with, and that's, you, probably, you probably noticed that in the way the body was found, I felt. I felt real anger towards him. By June 1993, Colin Ireland had killed three times. All his victims were gay men. All picked up at the same West London pub. 
People often say, well, why did he go back to the same pub? But that makes a lot of sense in the sense that he's comfortable, he knows where he's going, he knows what he's doing. And more important, if people do check him out, he's been there enough times that, to be almost one of the locals, one of the regulars. So that gives him some safety, some security. But at the same time, what a buzz he's going to get from doing something right under the nose of, of the police and the gay community. As a serial killer, Ireland was stepping up the pace. Just three days after murdering Perry Bradley, he was back at the Colhern. This time, the victim was 33-year-old Andrew Collier. As with the others, Ireland went to his flat, tying him up to the bed and demanding his pin number. With Collier bound, he searched through his possessions. For the second time, he discovered his intended victim was HIV positive. Angry, he set about burning parts of Collier's body. But his sadism didn't end there. To humiliate him further, he killed his pet cat in front of him. I um, stuck a noose around his neck and hung it over a door. Collier was next to be killed. Just as he'd done with his first victim, Ireland stuffed condoms into his mouth. What's interesting from the police point of view is having one dead body with a condom that's unusual, to have two is extremely unusual, and that would again be something that would link. And we've got lots and lots of links, gay men, condoms, animals, pub, shared pub, the same pattern, the tying up was the same. The police would clearly see a link. Until this point, the police had seen no link. But now a new team of detectives, led by Albert Patrick, were assigned to the Collier murder case. They were shocked by what confronted them, and they were determined to solve it. The scene was extremely unusual. Uh, there was somebody had obviously killed him and, and killed the cat and, uh, and, and laid it in a position with condoms uh, on, the, on the end of the tail and in his mouth. Uh, so that was most certainly the first time I've ever seen it in my life, and I think it's the first time it's probably ever happened in the United Kingdom. If a member of the public was to watch the reaction of the officers who first came across that, they'd be probably quite startled. No one would like to imagine that any relative or friend even would be found in those circumstances. Well, I mean, it was just an amazing scene. I mean, you just don't see anything like that. I mean, he was laid out in a sort of ritualistic way. There were clearly marks on the arms and legs to indicate he'd been tied. There was a ligature mark around the neck, so it's fairly obviously been strangled. Um, burn marks uh, on his chest from cigarettes. There was also pubic hair being burnt. So some burns in the hair. We had a lot of experienced detectives there. I mean, they'd never seen anything like it. I remember sort of with, with Walker uh, and with Collier standing by the bed and saying, well, what do you think of this, Sergeant so-and-so? I don't know, sir. And, and Joe, as if, you know, how you would you would react when you came in and, and, and saw it. And, he, and he's right, actually. We probably did say, well, look at that, Sergeant, that's unusual. Bear in mind, lots of people had seen the body before I had, ambulance crew, the neighbours, and they were probably all thinking exactly the same. I don't think... I could ever get inside the mind of a person who would do that. It was so bizarre. So bizarre, it prompted the new team of officers to look beyond the murder of Andrew Collier. Uh, yeah. Were there any other recent unsolved killings that bore similar hallmarks? One of the jobs I had was to trawl back through to see if I could pick out any that may be linked. And I actually pulled out Perry Bradley's and I found the office over there. And he told me that, no, it wasn't linked because their particular victim, Perry Bradley, wasn't gay, which we know was false. Uh, I think that was said to protect the family. With Bradley not revealed as gay and with Christopher Dunn's death filed as accidental, it was unsurprising that the cases had never been linked. But then detectives began to study details of another death earlier that year. Well, very quickly I became aware of the uh, Peter Walker case, which had happened a few months before. Although there wasn't a cat draped on the body, there was a teddy bear draped in similar circumstances. So uh, there was obviously uh, a concern in my mind that we had the potential for serial killer on hands. Finally, there was coordinated police action. Officers from different areas of London began collating information and appealed to the gay community by visiting pubs and clubs around the capital. 
But despite police involving Gallup, the gay and lesbian policing charity, there were big bridges to build and no one seemed willing to talk. But five days after Andrew Collier's murder, one man did want to speak and he phoned Kensington Police Station to do it. He knew a serial killer was on the loose because he was the serial killer. Once again, it seemed Ireland wanted his gruesome work to be noticed. And he's trying to explain to me that he'd committed a murder in the last couple of days. And I said to him, OK, can you, can you obviously tell me how am I going to believe you? And he went into the facts and said, well, I'll tell you. He said, I, um, I killed a gentleman the other day. And what I've done is I've placed the tail of the cat into his mouth. This pricked my ears up and I started to think this is real, not a prankster call. It was as though he needed to be caught. He fa I felt he wanted to be caught. Fifteen minutes later, he made another phone call. Later in the day, a third. That makes me a serial. I'm not going to make it too easy for you. There's a connection. Finally, Ireland contacted Battersea Police Station. At the end of these calls, detectives knew the four deaths were the responsibility of just one man. Fortunately, it wasn't through any clever detective work. Uh, the linking was done as a consequence of Colin Ireland asking, Sir? why haven't you linked these four murders? Okay. And he listed the names of the people involved and where they were. But Ireland was eager to give them even more sensational news. While they'd been busy investigating the death of his fourth victim, he'd gone out and killed yet again. DC, who, who picked up the call just as he would any other call coming into the office, uh, clearly was thinking uh, at a million miles an hour. But what was, what was your aim in all that? Cool, calculated, he knew what he was doing. He was playing a game with us. How do you stop him? Ireland had claimed his fifth victim, Emmanuel Spiteri, just five days after killing Andrew Collier, and he'd met him yet again during a visit to the Coal Hearn. I did talk to him then. I saw him on the tube station a little bit later. I was caught when I bumped into him. Um, got talking to him then. The two men made their way back to Spiteri's South London flat via several trains. When they got there, Ireland, now a pro, cuffed and bound him put a noose around his neck and demanded his pin number. But unlike the other victims, Spiteri refused and said nothing. And he started to shake his head up and down. But I think that was more of a, a reaction to being strangled. Ireland craved a greater buzz for this, his fifth murder. He had reached a whole new level in humiliating his victim. And then piled all the papers and furniture together in the centre of the room for no particular reason, but I reached a point where I'd, I couldn't have stopped myself. With Spiteri laying dead, Ireland set the flat on fire. He made his way back to South End, calling in to see his friend Richard Higgs on the way home. But this time, his behaviour was erratic. You got a few minutes. First thing I noticed was that uh, he just dropped his bag on the floor. Whereas normally he'd, he'd hold, you know, his bag would be held in sort of great regard, and he'd be very careful with it. Of course, come with me. Fine, good. Just want to come and have a chat. He was he was speaking very oddly. He was speaking in the third tense. He he grabbed my young daughter's hand and said, do you want to come and see the, the chipmunks? I grabbed her other hand, because I was feeling very uncomfortable about him, and said, we hadn't got time. And he stopped, and in the third tense, he, he said, um, I ask if she wants to see the chipmunks. He says, no, no, you can't. Um, and I just wanted to get away as quickly as possible. 
Back in London, the police received a call from Emmanuel Spiteri's landlady. The fire had burnt itself out, but her lodger was lying dead. Here he is, he's killed now five, three in a week. The tremendous pressure, unbelievable. It was uh, stress at 110 plus. It really was a difficult time. There was no time to waste. Just hours after locating Spiteri's body, the police arranged a midnight press conference. Thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm sure you're, you're wondering why this time late at night. If Ireland had struck yet again that night and he was in the front room of a victim's house and it came on television, then that just could have stopped another murder. It has now been established this afternoon, pathologically, forensically, that those murders are linked. There has been a fifth development tonight, a murder which bears features to the others that we are investigating. News reports warned the gay community to be careful in case the killer was preparing to strike again. And the police did another press conference, this time aimed directly at the killer. Enough is enough, enough pain, enough anxiety, enough tragedy. Give yourself up. Officers were dispatched onto the streets to appeal for more information. Their target, London's Gay Pride Festival, attended by more than 50,000 people. I have got a lot of time and a lot of praise for one particular member of the gay community who had, uh, who had uh, the guts to come forward and actually talk to us. Wasn't, wasn't easy, his parents didn't know he was gay and he, he gave us an excellent description. He was on the same train as uh, Spiteri and Ireland going down to Heather Green. Soon other witnesses came forward, all offering descriptions of the man police were looking for. As a result, they were able to issue an e-fit but more importantly, they'd also been given 450 hours of CCTV footage to sift through. The images were captured at Charing Cross, the station Emmanuel Spiteri would have used to travel home to South London before he was murdered. Finally, the officers identified him and had an image of the killer. This is the picture. The man on the right is Emmanuel Spiteri. The man on the left is the one police want to trace. By the next day, police had received more than 40 calls from people, some of them claiming that they'd seen or met the man in the Colherne. Back in South End, Ireland had recognised himself from the CCTV and knew others would too. So he visited a solicitor, complete with an alibi. Yeah, it was. And it was me on the e-fit they're showing, but I didn't kill him. I was with him on the night, and I went back towards his flat with him, but there was already somebody in there, and I didn't want to be part of that, so I just turned around and left. Right, just let's take a seat. Ireland may have been expecting a visit from detectives at some stage, but he didn't know they'd already identified him and were on their way to South End. What he also didn't know is that he'd made a huge mistake at one of the crime scenes. Police needed concrete evidence to charge Ireland, and now they've got it. That was his only mistake. There was no other forensic evidence whatsoever other than that single fingerprint. The identification of Colin Ireland on CCTV had given detectives their first major breakthrough in their hunt for the serial killer. But although he'd been captured on film alongside one of his victims, he'd prepared an excuse. And I didn't want to be part of that, so I just turned around and left. He may have thought he could explain away the CCTV, but the police had more to go on than that. The second breakthrough, uh, for the total investigation was the fingerprint at Andrew Collar's address. One of the marks we found in this fellow, which turned out later to be quite significant, was on this rail here. Subsequently, we found that the mark we lifted from here was identical with Ireland. How had Ireland made this mistake? After every killing, he'd been meticulous in cleaning up, but soon after arriving at Andrew Collier's flat, there'd been a disturbance outside. Whilst looking through the window, Ireland had left his mark and, for the first time, forgot to wipe it clean afterwards. 
That was his only mistake. There was no other forensic evidence whatsoever other than that single fingerprint. To be dispatched uh, down to South End at that time was a bit of an adrenaline rush because we really felt that this was going to be the break we needed and we we're going to arrest the man who'd killed five people in London. When Ireland returned to the solicitor's office later that day, Terry Webster was waiting for him. Colin Island. Colin Island, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. Do you have anything to say? He had made a written statement which was handed to us on that document. Colin Ireland said that he was the person in the photograph that had been published in the paper. He was with Emmanuel Spiteri that night, but hadn't gone in because when he got to the door, there was a third person inside the address, and he turned then and left because he didn't want to be part of that. Essentially, Ireland was deadpan. Uh, he just kept silent, wouldn't talk to us. I think he was confident enough to think that he could black his way through it. So how long have you lived in South End? Having arrested Ireland for the five murders, uh, he was then to be conveyed back to Islington Police Station. I sat in the back with him. I tried to engage Colin Ireland in conversation. Uh, the driver of the vehicle, listening to Colin Ireland speak, recognised his voice as being the same voice that he'd had on the telephone. During uh, two days of interview, he never opened his mouth, never said a word. Once the question was finished, he just turned back and stared at me again. It was really, really difficult. I then told him that we had a fingerprint, finger and that shocked him. He wasn't expecting it. Um, and it was the only reaction we got throughout that whole interview. But once he'd recovered himself, he went back to just staring and didn't respond any further. The police had what they needed to charge Ireland with the murder of Andrew Collier. Two days later, they charged him with the murder of Emmanuel Spiteri. Ireland, on remand in prison, remained silent for weeks. Before suddenly finding his voice. I'm the gay serial killer. Tell police I want to confess and confess he did. I, was, I wasn't um, forced to do this. I wasn't, I, I, in fact, when I was last interviewed by the police for five days, I said nothing on tape. I spent, then spent a month in prison considering my mental, uh, my mental state, my, my, my outlook and what had happened. Um, and I probably didn't come to a final decision until maybe yesterday. I, I wanted to create a situation where I couldn't really back out of my decision, so I deliberately spoke to the prison officers regarding this. I said I was intending to change my plea to a plea of guilty. I think uh, I, I should be placed in a position where I can no longer inflict harm upon others. One, one of the things you find with serial killers is that they will deny everything until they know they're faced with all the knowledge that the police have, all the same knowledge they have, then they will admit it straight away. It's part of the game. And if they're holding the cards and they have more cards than the police, then they will carry on denying it. But once they realise the police have the same number of cards they have, they, they own it. The day after Ireland delivered his frank and horrific confession to police, they charged him with the three other murders of Christopher Dunn, Perry Bradley and Peter Walker. Unlike other high-profile serial killers, Ireland pleaded guilty to all charges, meaning there was no need for a full trial, only the need for a judge to pass sentence. By any standards, you are an exceptionally frightening and dangerous man, he said. In cold blood and with great deliberation, you have killed five of your fellow human beings. You killed them in a grotesque and cruel fashion. The fear, brutality and indignity to which you subjected your victims are almost unspeakable. To take one human life is an outrage. To take five is carnage. You express the desire to be regarded as a serial killer. That must be matched by your detention for life. Ironically, by pleading guilty, Ireland made sure his fame would never match that of other multiple murderers like Hindley and Brady, Sutcliffe, Nielsen or West. But his crimes 
were every bit as evil. It was devastating for my children. My son took a very long time to get over it. He thought he'd got a new dad and he hadn't. And um, it took him years and years to get over it. I'm not even sure that he has now. Um, and then afterwards, we felt relieved because it could have been us. And we thanked God that we were saved. To have known someone personally who, who then you find has behaved in that way is, is quite frightening, quite disconcerting disconcerting for yourself to discover that. I am quite surprised that he was never considered a psychopath. As far as I know, that was never brought up, never suggested, but I feel he didn't have any remorse. And as with every serial killer, a further question remains. Were there other victims? Ireland has since boasted to a cellmate that there were many. Detectives think there was at least one more. Has he killed any others? One particular case in January of 1993, uh, a, a man living alone in Southland, a gay man, had actually been in a call home. The body was found. It was treated as a sudden death and the dogs, through starvation, had eaten uh, the owner. I think that troubled him and that was probably, he didn't want to confess to that because of how the body was found. The truth? Only he really knows. But what we do know is that tragically Colin Ireland's New Year's resolution came true. He got his wish after all and became a serial killer. I can't say why he did it. He, whether it was for fame or whether it was to be somebody, to be noted, to be recognised, I don't know, but um, I just don't know.